The Dominican Rite, as all the monastic rites or even the local rites, are not anomalies. They are really related and part of the parent rite, the Roman Rite. And our future is bound up in the Roman Rite. And I think the monastic rites, such as the D Dominican Rite, have a place in, in that de further development and reflection on the Roman Rite in both forms, especially as we hope the Roman forms influence one another. I know it, for example, in the Dominican Rite, and I will speak mostly about the Dominican Rite, not the other monastic rite so much, but what I say about the Dominican Rite is probably true for the other monastic rites. And what I mean by the monastic rites is this. You might know from 1570 in the promulgation of the Missal of Pius V that other rites were permitted. There was not a universal... Uh, while the rite of, of Pius V was meant to be uh, used throughout Europe, rites of certain locations and religious orders that had existed in continual use for more than 200 years remained. The most famous of these being then the Mosaic rites in Toledo, Spain, the Ambrosian rite in Milan, and the rites of the religious orders, the Gilbertines, who have since died away, the Old Carmelites, the Cistercians, the Carthusians, the Premonstratensians, and the Dominicans. All of these, then, have existed, or in some form, since, since early in their foundation. And all of them, like I said, are related to, then, the Dominican Rite. But they're not simply, or rather, the Roman Rite. They're not simply, then, the Mass. But they're caught up in the entire life of those particular places or orders. It's not a particular order of mass, but for the example in the Dominican Rite, Dominican Rite comes organically, emerges organically out of Dominican life. As one, uh, one historian of liturgy, Archdale King, had said that Dominican Rite is essentially liturgical. The Dominican order was founded as an order of canons, and though their mission became one of preaching, that core of who St. Dominic was and who the early Dominicans are remained for 800 years till this day. The life of the Dominican is very much caught up in the order of the day. Even when we're not in the priory at home, that order is essential to our life, that structure of contemplative prayer, of the divine office, and of course the holy sacrifice of the mass. It's all one, and it all relates directly to our chapters, our meals that we take in common. Everything for us becomes a liturgical act. In fact, as, as a superior of my community, as the prior, I know that if we pray, then I have to provide always something to eat. It's something that's just worked into Dominican structure. <laughs> after, after prayer, it's time for something to eat. The, the whole life, then, of the Dominican, directed then it's not about mission. It's actually, we've always called ourselves, especially after Thomas Aquinas speaks about mixed orders in his Summa, the Dominican order is actually contemplative. Now, sometimes we wonder at that the way we run around, and you see me even here passing through this conference only to give this talk. So sometimes I wonder about the contemplation, but, but it's not time always. It's the direction. It's the object. The object of Dominican life is God. St. Dominic spoke of God and to God. So to God in prayer, and we must speak to God, we must listen, or we'll have nothing to say. Because it's not about what we say, it's about speaking of the one who we met just after the apostles, where Andrew says to Peter, come, meet the one that we have been waiting for. Well, this is part of Dominican life. Essential Dominican life is that structure of prayer. When we speak about the different rites, sometimes I have some fun bantering with different people about the different rites, so much like a Dominican might have bantering about Jesuit, uh, the Society of Jesus. But I don't, personally, I actually don't, if they're a funny joke, it's fine, but actually I don't take much credence in any of those things. The tradition of the different religious orders are very important. The traditions of the various places are very important. They provide insights in the tradition lived out well in the various orders. They provide insights into the activity of God, into theology, 
in the different traditions of the church provide then ways of speaking about the Lord or ways for us to access then uh, the, the wisdom of the church. It's part of that great storehouse of our faith in its diversity, right? And diversity was something that comes from the church more than anywhere else. And it's, we can't allow that word to be hijacked. But diversity in the various rites, practices, traditions of the church, that great storehouse where we bring out things old and new. And so just like the orders and our traditions, the rites then, sometimes there's a bantering that we'll have with a Roman or Dominican because we have servers in our church that very much cross over between the rites. But really, no rite is better than the other. Each rite then speaks then to some aspect of the faith. Look at the Byzantine rite, how different it is, how, how, much, how similar it is in the same structure. We can take the Roman rite, the Dominican rite, the Byzantine, the Armenian, and compare it directly then to the, what Justin writes down. St. Justin writes down in those early centuries. We see that core part of what the Mass is, and yet everything else looks different, speaking to those central truths in a unique way. You take the Byzantine church, for example. Sometimes people will say, well, it's wonderful, but they don't have Eucharistic adoration. And I say, yes, that's true. That is true. That's something that's developed in the West in a wonderful way and something that we can teach to the universal church, our exposition, our adoration of the Most Holy Sacrament. And while the East can learn from that, they pray. And they can pray anywhere because they understand in a way that we don't how we're temples of the Holy Spirit and how God is present everywhere, even in the deserts where the Eastern monks founded then the way of life that influenced the whole church. The history of the Dominican Rite grew organically from its foundation. The order was founded in southern France by St. Dominic to combat the Albigensian heresy. He himself was a canon in Spain. He took that life and adopted it to the order that he founded. He took that life and cut away some of the things that were related to stability, recognizing that he needed a troop of friars to go out. And in fact, the order is founded in 1216 on Pentecost 1217. He sends out all of his brothers two by two to establish the order throughout Europe. The order is contemplative, but it is once immediately itinerant, going out into the world. But he gave them the, the rule of St. Augustine and, his, and the particular constitutions from which uh, he borrowed heavily from the Norbertine constitution and sent them out to establish then really places where canons would be established, places of prayer from which preaching would happen. As the Dominicans went out to different parts of Europe, especially at the beginning, England, France, Germany, and Italy, and also then there were visitors from Poland, especially in St. Hyathens and Blessed Ceslas, that came to meet St. Dominic. He established them in a special way and sent them back to their own province. As the Dominicans went throughout the world, they discovered then a very diverse world very unique liturgical practices. This is really where all the monastic uh, rites rise up, first out of the context of who they are, but also recognizing the need for a universal rite. For example, the Cistercian Order really is one of the first international institutions in the world. With their Abba General and this system of visitation, they recognized many, uh, the need for many apparatus to unite them together as one order which was also a developing concept in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. The Dominicans, too. You have the Dominicans going out to Paris. They're in Bologna. They're in Germany and other places. And as they're transferred or visit between the houses, they find that the rites are extremely different because the liturgical rites, and this was a need for the later, part of the need for the later reform of 1570, each city has its own play, rite. And so as the, or as the Dominicans would travel back and forth, they would use the local rite, especially in the communities established there, both the office and the mass, but they recognized the need for a universal rite to bind them together and to make their life a little bit more 
uh, simple and to really articulate then and bring about what it was in their in the their own life that they wanted the liturgy to speak to and the life then to influence the rite itself. We see in the Dominican rite, I think as any rite, not only is it is it have the certain practices that maybe an order wants to emphasize, but I said it organically grows out of the rite and really often speaks some to the theology or the focus of that particular order or place. So in the case of the Dominican Rite, you have then practices both within the office and the mass that really articulate the spirituality of the order in a unique way. And I'll come back to that in a few moments when I speak about some of the elements of the Dominican Rite. So this chaos, kind of, that, is, that was there present in the early order is really contrary much to the Dominican mind. And already, if St. Dominic didn't already want a uniform rite, the second mass of the order, Blessed Jordan of Saxony, began to seek out then methods of, of bringing about a uniform way of prayer throughout the order. After several chapters, general chapters, in which are inter, international meetings of, of Dominican friars, in 1244, he, he commissions a committee of four friars. I think meetings and committees must have been they're part of the early order, just as it are today. A way of penance, I suppose. But he, he commit, this committee is formed of a, a friar from Germany, Italy, Spain, and France. And their job is to bring liturgical books from their region. And they bring, then, these, these books. It's interesting, unfortunately, England was not chosen to be part of that committee because they, of course, have, especially at that time, a unique, diverse, and very beautiful form of the Roman rite and their own rites, such as the Sarum rite. This committee then looks through their books and relies heavily on what the French Dominican brings. And that first, for about 10 years, we attempt to adopt this liturgy, but for some reason, the different theories about it, that that, that rite was not well received by the friars or the cloister nuns of the order in some places, but not in others. And so a later mass of the order, Blessed Humbert of Romans, then works at it again and says, let's, let's look back. And this is where we really get the Dominican rite. So the Dominican rite, as we know it, dates from about 1256. And that rite is very interesting. What he did was take then the Roman rite as it was practiced at the time. And by here at this date, when we say Roman rite, we mean the rite of the city of Rome. In particular, he took the rite of the Roman basilicas outside of the papal chapel. So some of the basilicas where you have what we had termed today cardinal deans, then presiding at the liturgy, they took that liturgy, brought it into the order, added a few elements, especially some Gallic or, or French uh, influences, and adopted the calendar, especially then from Rome and Paris, and formed this particular rite. In some ways, not, a, not entirely, but in many ways it's a snapshot. The Dominican rite as we see today is a snapshot of that 13th century Roman rite with some other influences. We see that in, its, in the somber nature of the Dominican rite. At one of these conferences earlier, uh, it was a year or two ago, we had the opportunity to offer a Dominican psalm rite mass, which we do frequently at our church in Portland. But what was wonderful is that it was a ferial day in Lent. And so the monastic element of the right came through. On a feast day, we go all out, just like the Roman. But on a ferial day, I was a celebrant in chasuble, and there was a deacon and subdeacon without dalmatic and tunical. It was simple. It was a little bit more like the Carthusian. It was a little bit somber. And highlighting then those, that, those characteristics that are typical of the Dominican rite. One thing that Jordan and Humbert, the early masters of the orders, wanted was a liturgy that was brief and simple. 
Now we have to understand, sometimes I'm quoted this today by friars, especially as younger friars come in and we want more liturgy. Brief in the context of the 13th century. <laughs> so brief as compared to Clooney, you know. Brief so that we could have time for contemplation, silent prayer, as well as, of course, that we did not do manual labor. And uh, as you can, if you shake my hand, you'll know. <laughs> we study, even throughout our whole life. That's our work. Our cross is our desk, some, some have said. And it's true. And we study, and that's a, an, an additional place where we discover then truth and, and, and contemplation of the Lord. And so the liturgy was to be brief compared to the, uh, some of the other usages to provide room for this additional part of our life. Of course, um, typical of the tradition of canons, not of monks, but of canons, the Dominican order, uh, its office always, even this day, unites matins and lots. They're always together. And especially in, in the early centuries, matin lots followed by prime on most days would have occurred between midnight and 2 a.m., depending on the time of year. The Dominicans, uh, when there was midnight office or places that exist today, it's, there's two kinds of Dominicans, it said, and it's true. There are those who would stay up until the midnight hour and study and read and pray, or those that would rise in midnight and pray the office and community and then stay up for the morning. We still see this very much today in our own life of the two kinds of Dominicans, just like any family, I suppose, night owls and those who... Make noise in the morning. <laughs> so brevity. For, but, but not that brief. It's for the sake then, to highlight then the text. We see the, the, also the, the antiphons of the office were a little bit shorter in some cases, except for feast days. And the, the, the readings, in some cases, were shorter, especially in Easter. Easter had a time where, where there was a, a, a brevity after the more lengthy offices and practices of Lent. The other characteristic is simplicity. And I'd say the same thing about simplicity I said about brevity. This is 13th century simplicity. It's not to say, let's make it casual. It's to say that because then our focus then is, is poverty and preaching as the poor Christ, then even our liturgy should be simple. And you see that in its development. Yes, we use silk investments. Yes, we use incense. Yes, we use all the beautiful things that belong to the divine liturgy, the, the gold vessels, etc. But you see in the traditional way that the Dominican priests vest, even in the ordinary form, is perhaps a little bit more simple in relation to, to the Roman. Now, I think the, the developments in the Roman rite with... with uh, with vestments and, 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 and albs of lace is very good. I'm very pro-development, pro, pro uh, development. but I'm also, also we need to retain these particular elements as well. The Dominican Rite, for example, still uses apparelled amices and albs, five pieces protecting the weakest part of the amice and alb that represent then the five wounds of Christ or the way that we never really moved beyond the semi-Gothic chasuble. Only later did we adopt then many of the feasts of the Roman Rite and some of the practices, which I think, again, are good developments and good additions to our own Rite, but originally we didn't have a last gospel. We didn't have a chalice veil. We, we adopted all of these things from then the Roman Rite. I'll come back to brevity and simplicity at the end. The Dominican Rite in his form, a bit shorter than as we see in the Roman, but it was one of the first to be accepted by other communities. The Roman rite certainly was accepted by certain other churches outside of Rome, because certain places needed to reform or needed, or there was establishment of a church that sometimes the Roman books would be adopted. We see this very early in Venice, for example, Really, Venice's origins and its patriarchy has, had its own right 1,500 years ago, but very early on adopt Roman practices and add their own local usages for their own. 
The other orders then, as I said, are international, but they don't have the out as much influence outside of their priories as the Dominicans did. As the Dominicans were preaching, spreading their own books, they were in some cases becoming bishops and even early on there were a few popes. The, the, the rights then, they're bringing the liturgical books with them. These Dominican bishops bringing then the right to their new diocese or the orders that we help found. Though there are many places that we see either influenced by the Dominican Rite or adopting the Dominican Rite as a whole. Some of these groups include the Teutonic Knights, the Carmelites at one point. The Dominicans have a great influence upon the Carmelite Rite as it exists. Remember, this is the old Carmelite Rite. The Discalced Carmelites, Teresa and John chose to use the Roman Rite of 1570. The Mercedarians, which the order founded. The uh, diocese in Croatia Zagreb, uh, many, the majority of the dioceses in the Balkan and Scandinavian countries, especially Scandinavia, the court of Edward III in England, because it was a Dominican confessor or chaplain, a monastery in Greece, where the Dominican rite was celebrated in Greek, at least for a time, and of course Armenia, where the Dominicans had a, a, a one of our provinces very early on, the Friars of Unity, they were called. They were called to understand, uh, they were founded to understand the in this particular way, the Eastern Church, and work there towards unity, but the friars themselves used either in Latin or Armenian than the Dominican Rite. And so the Rite early on had a great influence upon the whole church, and I think, does it form the Roman later on? Maybe partly, partly, as many of the rites around Europe were considered as working towards the Missal of 1570. Certainly, the, the religious rites and the local rites had an influence upon the Roman. Uh, but we see those early efforts for an organized way of worship and, and the contributions, I think, of the rite. Really, when we look at, at, when we compare the Dominican rite and the extraordinary form of the Roman, we see many similarities. Textually, I think there's probably an 80% overlap, maybe more. But the rubrics and the practices are quite different. We see also, though the extraordinary form of the Roman Rite is longer than the Dominican, uh, and there are reasons for that, uh, partly a bit of tradition, as you see in the, in the traditional form of uh, the prayers of the, of the altar, but also in the offertory because of the development there in the Roman Rite, that's just, just a bit longer. But you see that same work towards clarity, Brevity, I think, and simplicity. And it's something that's very clear. And I think this is universal in the Roman church. You know, we know, and it's a wonderful thing, and it's something they do well. How many times do you do something in the Byzantine rite? It's always three times. But there's a reason for that. <laughs> so to, to bring it then, to make it alive in a person, to really reflect. Sometimes there's points where you chant the Kyrie eleison 40 times, 40 times, especially during Lent, or the many prostrations. Our liturgy of the Eucharist, our sacrifice of the Mass, has always been in this kind of Roman, somber, clear, uh, organized fashion. And that's where we have that framework to consider what is important. The Lord, especially in the sacrament, the sacrifice of the Mass, and the liturgical texts that form our minds and hearts that there's not extra. It's all focused to the text. Everything that is extra serves that text, such as our ritual, such as the beauty of our vestments, such as our incense, and most especially, music. I once told, uh, I don't know why I asked him this. Of course he knew this quote. I asked Dr. William Mart if he had remembered the, uh, one of the fathers says that the responsorium in the mass is the second homily. And he looks at me and says, Father, the responsory is the first homily. <laughs> and as a Dominican, I'd have to say, he's right. St. Dominic, in his own prayer, and he had taught his brothers to listen. This is our first point of Lexu Divina. And it's the only point of Lexu Divina in the Carthusian order. 
So you reflect then on the liturgy, what strikes you? An antiphon, part of a psalm, particular part of the mass that strikes you that day and to reflect on that. That's where there is sweetness for you that day and to reflect on that. The liturgy is, of course, a great teacher to us. And in the articulation of the text in music is, is a homily, is a particular way of speaking of that truth. One favorite of mine, I think it's actually a common tune, but maybe it's a Virgin Martyrs, but St. Cecilia's Feast Day always struck me. And the way that, typical of our theme actually, the voice of the bridegroom, that how the author or the, the, the composer of that ancient Gregorian uh, tune then speaks of the silence of the night and the music and how then uh, the joy and the elation of how the bridegroom comes and that we've been waiting for and is coming now to the feast. Some of the perhaps distinct elements of Dominican Rite, and I think these are, are certainly, there's two, th two points about them. They're not, again, just not just anomalies, but one is that as we look then to that hope and dream of the two rites influencing one another, we see some issues with, I think, especially as a pastor of people, I see there's some issues with some of those feast day elements, some of those external elements, so the things that aren't essential to the rite, some of the things like Ash Wednesday or Candlemas, where you have, for example, an Ash Wednesday, we all know, there's a priest here, Sometimes there's real resources in the Book of Blessing, and sometimes they don't really bless anything. They don't really do anything. They don't really articulate anything. There's, a kind of, there's an issue there. And yet, when we look at the extraordinary form, then you have five wonderful prayers for Ash Wednesday to bless the ashes. And they are wonderful. But how do we bring these to bear today? How do we bring about, what do we have to do? How can we adopt, perhaps, some of those prayers or consider it or dream of it? Do we really want to bring those five prayers back? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It's just a consideration. Anyway, so some of the Dominican elements perhaps can speak to that. And, of course, as I said, speak in a particular way to the general tradition of the church. So I mentioned feast days first. Ash Wednesday is a good example. Ash Wednesday, the prior comes out. There's always the prior of the community, if, he's, if there's a prior in that community. Or if not, it's the, whoever is the superior. And he blesses, blesses the ashes with a single prayer. It's a long prayer, but it's one. And he imposes this on the friars and then the people, if they are, if they are present. After that, we do something the Roman rite doesn't do. And this is true for the asparagus, blessing of ashes, candlemas, etc. We return to the sacristy. All those rites for us are distinct rites. Anything that's not part of the Mass is actually a distinct rite. In our office, our office was adopted from the same Roman basilicas, and originally it had a unique Psalter, not the Roman, not the Benedictine, but a unique Psalter that was from an ancient monastic source. The office, as I said, the office, the first hours, matins, lauds, and often prime were celebrated at midnight. Uh, Terce in the morning, um, uh, later on, uh, sext, and then mass at noon in most houses, known at three, vespers later on, or, or they were close, close together around a meal, and then Compline at night. Compline, it's interesting. Compline, it was probably the most important, it's the most major hour of the Dominican order, still is today which is unusual and has the most variable, we probably have the most variable compliment in the church. The different antiphons, many, many tunes of the Te Lucis having to do with feasts, changes for various feasts of our saints, changes of the, of the doxology, changes of antiphons, changes for the seasons. So we have all these unique elements that are, are there in our, our compliment. The Dominican order, we've always been one of exemption which is interesting. We, before the divine office was uh, mandated, because of the development of the breviary, partly, mandated no matter what, 
The Dominican order, just like the Eastern Church today and, and, our, and many of the, the monasteries in Western history, we were ex- if we couldn't be present at office, we were exempt from it. You didn't say it. You might say some other prayers. You might make up for it with other prayers, perhaps our fathers and Hail Marys or some of the Psalms, something. But if you were cooking for the community, if you were preaching, if you had to have, if you were in charity having some conference with somebody in need, then your brothers would take care of that. We see this today in the Benedictine tradition where we pray for our absent brethren at the end. The Dominican order always prays for the dead. This is a, we have a devotion always to pray if we have a, for the deceased. There's another aspect of the Dominican rite is it, so many suffragists in our order, constant prayer for the dead, even for many centuries offering a daily mass for deceased friars and benefactors. But Compline was the one hour that no one was exempted from, that everyone had to be present for Compline, and most especially the Salve procession at the end. Unlike the Roman rites, we do not have variable, this is one part that's not variable in Compline, the Marian Antiphon. We always use the Salve, and that was because during the 11th and 12th, 13th centuries, that had become popular to add the Salve at the end, which probably comes from the Cistercians, the Dominicans adopted it because of an issue of, of deliverance, actually, with one of the uh, sisters uh, and, and in one of the, also one of the friars. And so Blessed Jordan of Saxony very early mandated this for the whole order to place in a special way at the end of the day the whole order under the patronage of the Blessed Virgin Mary, especially by singing the Salve. And so we always remain singing the Salve and never added any other Marian antiphons. We do add various Dominican antiphons, and different places have other antiphons at the end. For example, the friars in Krakow have, the, uh, uh, they have a special antiphon for St. Hyacinth, whose tomb is in their church. So in a few minutes here, let's, I just emphasize or, or highlight some of the differences of the Dominican mass, especially since I know people talk about right, people are most interested in the Eucharistic sacrifice. The Mass, as I said, is probably 80 to 90% textual similarity to the extraordinary form of the Roman Rite. But there are differences. Archbishop Sample, when he was present with us uh, in choir, had said how similar the text was and how entirely different the rubrics are. And that's very true. And he witnessed a solemn high Mass. And he was actually, as if, if any of you know him, he was complaining a little bit because, well, I got a gremial veil, he did not. Um, <laughs> but that's because... We adopt then those practices from those bishops' masses, those masses of the other Roman basilicas. One thing you see right away in the Dominican Rite is the, is the preparation of gifts. My, um, one of my brothers in my community, Father uh, Gerald Buckley, was serving mass in a, a, years ago in a different place. And uh, he came over at the beginning of the Dominican Rite and... and, and to the corner of the altar. And the server's looking at him. And he says, wine and water. And the boy says, oh no, Father, that comes later. I'll tell you when. <laughs> the, one of the good developments, I really believe, of the, of the reform of Trent was a clear offertory and a clear preparation of gifts. But before that, there was no particular time. In the low mass, we do it first thing. The absolute first thing, you bless the water and put it in, and wine the water in the chalice. In a Misa Cantata, it's done at the altar between the, uh, the epistle and the gospel. In the Solemn High Mass, it's done at the sedia, sitting down, and the subdeacon with, with a humeral veil brings the chalice to the priest and deacon, and they prepare the water and wine right at the bench. And this, was kind of, this wasn't only found in the Dominican Rite, but this is found throughout the church. Especially in, in, for example, the psalm rite, there was just no clear time for preparation of the gifts. And you see this, anyone again who knows the Byzantine rite, you know, the water and wine the, the, and the loaf is prepared first before even the actual divine liturgy proper begins. One other uh, clear difference is the prayer at the foot of the altar. Now, the prayer at the foot of the altar is not only earlier than what we find in extraordinary form, it really encapsulates, really captures part of what it means, I think, to be Dominican. 
and I'll read just in English for the sake of time, our particular confiteor. And you'll find this, you find this, for example, you'll find unique confiteors in the Benedictine order, for example, that would include St. Benedict, especially in the examination at Compline, or the Carmelite rite, where you'll find the reference of Isaiah. Well, ours is, I confess to Almighty God, to Blessed Mary, ever virgin, to Blessed Dominic, our Father, to all the saints and to you, my brothers, that I've greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my speech and what I have done and what I have failed to do through my fault, I ask you to pray for me. And that's it. There's not a double formula. A double formula came later. A lot of the earlier rites have that single formula. But here we mention St. Dominic. And the reason for this is not just because of our founder. This, and I said that it encapsulates the spirituality of our order. This is almost word for word to the beginning, the formula of our vows. So when we sin or we break the rule, it's against God. It's against Blessed Mary. It's against Blessed Dominic. And our brothers, to whom we took our vows. So that's, that's, that reminds us at each Mass, then, the impact of our, own, of our own sins, our own faults, and how we need to ask healing before the Lord, right at the altar. You see that in the Byzantine rite, too, where it, a, a bishop or priest, he may confess his sins to another bishop or priest elsewhere, but the absolution happens at the altar, where he was ordained, because those sins are against the altar. And so in the Dominican Rite, the sins are against the altar and against the community. And we ask then pardon and mercy. I had mentioned the, very, the times of various preparation of the, the uh, gifts. One of the unique things, uh, you see, especially as we consider or hope for a new options for the offertory, the Dominican Rite was uh, very simple. There's much good development, including the addition of a kind, a kind of, this another whole, this whole talk of its own, kind of epiclesis prayer in the old offertory. But ours had a single offering, and it was this. This is un, very similar to the Roman. Receive, O Holy Trinity, this offering, which I present in memory of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, and grant that it may ascend to you worthily in your sight, and may bring about eternal salvation for, and uh, my eternal salvation and that of the faithful. This prayer... Is, is the only prayer in the offertory. And what's most fascinating is that the priest offers it at once. The chalice with the paten and host on top. And so while I think this is a particular place where I think the development in the Roman is very good, here, at least theologically, we have something to offer, a reminder then that the whole sacrifice is one. We offer the one lamb and then he sacrificed. This is my body, this is my blood. And then there's a sign of the resurrection, the comixio, which is present in every rite of the church, the mixing of the body and blood of our Lord, and, and, and to represent then not only the unity of the whole church, but also then the resurrection of Christ from the dead. We have our unique, a unique uh, formula for Holy Communion. And rather than praying then for only the soul, it's an earlier form that, that prays then for the salvation of the person. And again, this is no, here it is, uh, may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep me unto life everlasting, or you, if it's for communion. And what is this saying? It really captures that Dominican idea that the whole person is saved that we were founded to fight a heresy that rejected the goodness of creation. And so even the rite itself speaks to that. Yes, this is going to bring salvation to your soul, but also to your uh, body. So those are some, there are many more, I suppose. Those are some of the, the elements. Oh, I do want to add one more. One more that's not found in the Roman. And this is a great thing found in many of the monastic and local rites. At, after the consecration of the body and blood of Christ. In the prayer, Unde et Memores, the Dominican holds his hands out in the form of a cross. And I, I, that's something that's not found in the Roman. The Roman still is the same, same position, but the Dominican, uh, it's also found in the Ambrosian rite. The Carthusian is wonderful. It's speaking about how a rite, a practice in the mass, speaks of that tradition 
the Carthusians hold their arms directly out, form of a cross. So they are the cross, where we represent a little bit more standing in the person of Christ. Also, then, there's some discussion. I said Epiclesis are, are this own talk or discussion, something I'm not an expert in. But the prayer asking the angel of the Lord to take the sacrifice to the altar in heaven, the Dominican will, will cross his arms and bow, representing that angel. And not an angel, we think, but really the angel of God, the Holy Spirit. What's wonderful about some of these traditions, like the crossing arms, like the kissing of the chalice, when we place the most blessed sacrament into the chalice, that these, right, these, use, these particular elements of the rite, even unknown to some of the friars, have influenced the way we say our Mass today. In fact, meant from our rite, though generally we use the Roman in our houses, those particular practices have influenced our own naturally, organically, our order today. So you'll have houses that are entirely ordinary form, and yet have so many Dominican practices in their life, the way they're living their life, in their manner of prayer, in the way we say our divine office, in the choir rubrics, how we do things, and the way we say mass, our distinct way of lifting the thurible rather than swinging it, the crossing of the arms, the kissing of the chalice, the, the simplicity of our right in giving time then to focus on, on Christ. All of these different aspects influence the way, organically, the way we live today. And so, as we look at a continued organic development of the, all the rites of the Roman Church, especially the Roman rite, I think it's worth considering the Dominican and other rites, too, to see how is it work there. In Milan, you have two forms of, of their own rite. Now, we don't have two forms, unfortunately, the Dominican rite, but we can still see what are the, some of the elements that can be retained and really work today. And now there's some of us, and I, not, I don't know. Hey, for me, I'll just be honest. I'd rather just go back. I, this is me. This is me personally, okay? Now, is that a reality everywhere? And I think we have to consider that. I'm not so sure. For example, the offertory. How well will that be received everywhere? Cardinal Sarah said, let's have the option, which is great. But is there another option? I'm not saying there should be. It's just a consideration. Is there another option? Could we go a simpler route? Could we have a clearer offertory prayer without having five of them. And I don't mean that. I'm all for the extraordinary form of offertory. I'm just asking. For as a wider reception, we have a third option. It's worth considering these things. So the Dominican Rite and the other monastic and local orders, let us not forget them because, again, we're bound up in the success of the extraordinary form. The motu proprio was for us and indeed clarified in 2011 when it was expanded to the Domin so it was interesting, in, in 2007, the Dominican order, for the first time, including myself, received permission to say the extraordinary form. We did not actually have that before. So that was the first time. And actually, I, I've celebrated it. I, I don't know it as well as I should, but I have. And I certainly assisted many times in extraordinary form. And then in 2011, it was clarified it was for all the rights, though we had an earlier privilege from 1964, thankfully. But it was clarified it was spent at all. Our success, we're, we're bound up with one another. And we should see that diversity as an opportunity, again, to reflect on the whole Roman church and to say what works, what we can learn from one another, and what can we do, especially looking at the future. We're in a place, and I hope, we hope, you know, that we can continue to consider the liturgy. And let us do then what the friars did in, in the 1240s and consider the rights of Europe and the rights of the Western church. Let us do what what the reformers did in, in the 16th century and consider the rights of the church. And as we look forward now and, and try to discern and pray for a future of the two forms influencing one another, let us then consider then the legitimate and good traditions of the whole Roman church and, and look forward uh, the, uh, that prominence of the liturgy in our world today. I would say, finally, as we consider, most of you, I think, consider the Roman rite in its two forms. Remember what I said, though, about the Dominican way of life. One priest in the eastern province, Father Sylvester Willerby, had said, a lot of people say there's not a Dominican spirituality. And I asked him, well, why, why do you think that? Why do they say that? He says, because it's not that different from the whole church. 
we're present at the church, not as rulers, but as servants. We do the work of the apostles, not to be recognized as such, but to support the bishops, the truth, and the people. And we pray at the heart of the church. And our worship and our preaching comes from that discovery of Christ. And so the Mass for us, Dominican Rite, and the ordinary form with Dominican usages, come right out of who we are. It's the crown of our day. It's the center of our day. It really influences our whole life. This is what the council teaches too, so I would urge us all, of course, to really make the holy sacrifice of the Mass the center of your day, but recognize in some way your whole day as Eucharistic, as bound up in that sacrifice. All of our hopes and our joys, all of our, our difficulties and anguish, all brought to the altar and the foot of the cross and the sacrifice of the Mass that we offer. This lecture was recorded at the 2017 Sacred Liturgy Conference. For additional information, including a schedule of our upcoming events, please visit our website at sacredliturgyconference.org.